Should I go? Okay. Um, I have a question for the seed lending folks. Um, can you touch on really briefly on the legal issues associated with it? And have you guys... I'm glad you asked, because that is a really important thing to go away from this today, knowing that in July, the Department of um, Agriculture in Pennsylvania um, challenged one of the seed libraries um, in Pennsylvania, um, because there are laws uh, that are developed, have been developed to, um, to regulate uh, commercial seed companies to make sure that what they're developing and making available to the public and to um, farmers and everybody who uses seeds uh, to make sure they get a really good product and they get what they are expecting to get. Um, but they were applying that to the, to the seed library. And so... Um, Basically, the seed library backed down, um, so they stopped providing the informal seeds that people were cultivating from their own gardens, and they only now off are offering the commercially available seeds. Um, as of today, uh, I don't think that, I haven't heard of anything in California where that um, has been raised as a, a legal challenge, but seed libraries across the country now are really concerned and are um, in the organizing uh, phase to be uh, proactive should other states uh, and their agricultural departments uh, come forward and challenge the uh, legality of what we're doing informally in our seed lending libraries. So pay attention. There are, um, there's a lot of updates that you can, you can get on mailing lists. There's a, um, let me just quickly, the name of the legal team that is uh, working on this issue um, in collaboration with uh, the Richmond Grows. Um, Rebecca Newber Newber Newburn is really involved in this. Um, it is, um, let me just quickly, because you can get on their mailing list. Um, a Sustainable Economies Law Center is addressing the legal aspect of this. So you can sign up to get an update. They're recommending that we proactively contact our uh, state agricultural department and just inquire and also to let them know that we want to sustain the um, purpose and function of our seed lending libraries. Um, but this is something just to uh, uh, stay tuned and, and follow and be ready to get involved. I have a question for Emily and Rachel about ESL clubs. Um, I think Hilda spoke a little bit about this, but do you, at, at your respective programs, uh, group at all into like beginner versus intermediate or advanced levels of English skills? Or? We actually do, um, and I forgot to mention this, but um, in the beginning, well, we have one ESL volunteer that is an ESL teacher, and so she comes like twice a month, and she will, we kind of let people self-select, so we'll number people into groups when we finally get into our bigger discussion group, and she will just kind of go more into sort of an English class, um, and so we just say, if you are new to speaking English, then you can join Pat. But that's basically all we do. And she's not there every time, so I don't know if it's necessary. Um, I have a question. Oh, actually, please finish. <laughs> um, we don't, uh, and, and actually I think it, it sometimes is, uh, it would be better if we could. Um, our volunteer structure is such that we don't have the capacity to um, do a beginning group, but a lot of people do come in and say, I'm a total beginner. And I say, that's great, you're in the right place. Go in with everybody else. Um, so it, it, the, the one that, the club we run turns out to be best for generally people that are, have a mid-level, that aren't very experienced and aren't very beginner, but we do have people that are beginners that come every week and people that are very experienced that come every week, so.
Um, just sort of feedback on that. Um, our very small, small, small program um, led by volunteers. Uh, one of the volunteers is with our literacy program also. And she's um, sort of uh, directing those that she feels are ready to graduate to Project READ, the literacy program, uh, or our community learning center. But they can still keep coming for the food. I have a question for, I believe it's uh, Cheryl. Um, you said that you do email blasts. Do you have a s system that you're using for oh. doing so? No, it's a system of just email. So uh, thank you for asking. What I do is I collect the emails from story time. So you know how you have your s traditional story time in your library? All I do is I just pass around a clipboard, have people write their emails, I put it in email contact lists, I email blast them maybe like once or twice a month, Sharon's shaking her head because I know she has a huge list herself at Mountain View, so I, yeah, just email blast. But the best thing to do is the parenting clubs. Uh, maybe in your area you guys have parenting clubs that are available. They have like groups and they e you send out one email and it blasts like 1,300 or 3,000 people at a time. So those parenting clubs are very important. And again, it's just one email and you capture practically thousands of people in two minutes. Thank you. A question for ESL. Did you have to do any marketing to get people to come in or was it just all uh, word of mouth? Uh, we, word of mouth is the most important um, the way it gets around, we put flyers out. Um, we sent it to our uh, adult school, and we've uh, had flyers like in the corner store and, and in a few places, but pretty much that's all we did. Same. I mean, we, we do have a monthly calendar, and we, I mean, advertise that way, but yeah, pretty much word of mouth. Okay, so I have a question for um, Paul and Michelle about the bike programs. Um, did you get any n negative pushback on those or resistance to try something so new and different? <laughs> Take it, Michelle. <laughs> I'm trying to think. Uh, I don't know if a lot of people wanted to do it, but there were definitely people in the system who were avid cyclists, and I easily had over 10 staff who said, hey, I want to help you with this in any way possible. Um, I probably didn't get a lot of, I didn't ask for any funding. I did request, you know, staff get paid for their time, and I think everyone got paid. I wouldn't say it was a huge, like, yes, let's do this. The, our communication strategist, Stephen Brewster, he championed it from the beginning, and he's in our administration, so that helped that he really liked the idea. Uh, we'll see about this next year. <laughs> Hi, I have a question here. Yeah, I'll, I'll, let me respond real quick. So, no. <laughs> you know, at our library, um, you know, we're, 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 we're given a lot of leeway. And if I can prove that it's going to connect with the community in any way, usually I get a go-ahead from the director and from the city. So that's how it works. Uh, I have a question for the pop-up library folks. Uh, Nicole, you mentioned, uh, I think Daniel asked, about the connection to anarchist politics and the tradition, very egalitarian tradition. And that differs a lot from our circulation practices at our libraries, which is very punitive based. Is there anything we can learn from pop-up libraries and the practice of giving away books and not expecting the same kind of relationship with our users? Is there anything we can integrate into our practices in circulation at our libraries? Um, the first thing I think of is just the um, incredible importance of books in the home for children and what a huge difference home libraries make for kids. Um, not just that children visit the library, have cards, have access to the library books, but that they have books in the home. Um, it, it makes a huge difference. So I see um, an that as an incredible argument for giving away books, not really caring if they come back. Um, yeah, so, and the, the focus of the Big Lift Little Libraries is completely on, on books for kids. So that's kind of where I see that.
there's one over here. Bill. This is uh, for Jen Laredo. Um, I didn't get to ask the question, but so, you know, if the program was to help sort of raise teen good feeling toward adults, that there, there are adults out there in the community that care about them, how is that affecting the teens? I mean, what have you seen that you can tell us about, about the success in doing that very thing for teens? Awesome question, thank you. Um, if you've worked with teens, you know that sometimes getting feedback from them is, is complicated, right? And um, I have to say that I consider their um, willingness to participate in the program to be the biggest endorsement, right? That they're willing to take a book to a teacher and then pose for a photo with the teacher or willing to take a book to their drama teacher and then have the whole class participate in doing this kind of photo shoot. Um, they're continually excited to suggest new nominations for new readers. And I think to me that's the biggest indicator. Yeah, I haven't had anyone come to me and say, oh, it makes me feel so good that so and so read such and such. And obviously that would be awesome, but I don't think that's a, I don't know many teens who are like that. You know, I've gotten a few, really? Oh, really, Mr. Burns is gonna read Twilight? That's awesome. But you know, I, they're not kind of responding to it in the level of like, oh, and that makes me feel valued. But um, I have to trust that that's happening deep in their hearts. Yeah. <laughs> That feel, you, that, you feel like you, yeah, okay. Um, this question is for Diane um, about Soundswell. Um, how do the musicians get paid for their work? I'm not sure I understand how they, what their incentive is, besides publicity, obviously. Well, the library pays, um, if it is an EP, uh, we take a minimum of four songs, it must be commercially produced, meaning, you know, they they didn't just um, record it with any equipment and burn it to disc. Um, four, to, four to five songs, we give them $50. Um, six to eight songs, $75. And then we consider a full LP to be nine songs or more, and we pay $100, and that's for two years. Um, so members of the community can download it. Um, and after they've filled out the license agreement and signed it and submitted their work, they, after four to six weeks, they get a check from the city of Santa Cruz. And, you know, I have a budget line for, for Soundswell that it comes out of. So does that answer? That's enough for them. Obviously, you have people who are interested in doing it um, because it, it's publicity. And it doesn't sound like a lot of money to me for a musician, but it must be enough because well, you're, you're getting people interested in doing it. I think it's a great idea. Actually, different musicians have different reasons for doing it. Some of the musicians just love music and want to get their music out there. And some of the musicians aren't even working musicians for money. The musician part of their life is just something they do for fun. Those pe a lot of these people are willing to donate it and I make them take the money. Uh, <laughs> other people really do look at it as just another way to get their music out into the community and to be more well known and in any avenue works. Uh, you know, some musicians are really poor and that hundred bucks, you know, might go a long way to help them produce their next album. Or, um, yeah, so, mm -hmm. and then and then some people are just, like I said before, really the historical archive aspect of it is what kind of draws them in, just to be a part of that historical record. So, you know, that's another big piece. Diane? My question's for Diane. <clears throat> is there an effort to try to capture some of the bands that came before 2012 and 13, like World Entertainment War, well-known bands from Santa Cruz? There isn't a concerted effort to do that yet. 
When I bump into individuals that have connections, I try to massage those relationships to get to get that kind of um, you know connection so that we could even just talk about it. Um, but but right now, I think we're still kind of in the in the core collection building phase um, with the current. You know, I, I don't think I think that we've maybe got about a quarter of the local music scene to actually you know, respond and submit their music. Thank you. All right, I, have, I have a comment. You guys look great up there. Seriously, this big panel thing, it's awesome. Thank you all very much for your contributions to the day and for sticking around and asking follow-up questions. How about a round of applause for our presenters, everybody? Yeah.